thank you all for coming out tonight. It's, it's really my good fortune to be here at the Appalachian Studies Center with both Chad and Bill. Bill has been an inspiration for me, to me in just going deeper into our histories, our mutual stories. I want to begin by reading a little bit of the intro to belonging. Talking about place where we belong is a constant subject for many of us. We want to know if it's possible to live on the earth peacefully. Is it possible to sustain life? Can we embrace an ethos of sustainability that is not solely about the appropriate care of the world's resources, but is also about the cre creation of meaning, the making of lives that we feel are worth living? Tracy Chapman sings lyrics that give expression to this yearning when she says, I want to wake up and know where I'm going. Again and again as I travel around, I'm stunned by how many citizens in our nation feel lost, feel bereft of a sense of direction, feel as though they can't see where our journeys lead, that they can't know where they're going. Many folks feel no sense of place. What they know, what they have is a sense of crisis, of impending doom. Even the old, the elders who have lived from decade to decade and beyond, say life is different in this time, way strange, that our world today is a world of too much, that this too muchness creates a wilderness of spirit, the everyday anguish that shapes the habits of being for those of us who are lost, wandering, searching. Like many of my contemporaries, I have yearned to find my place in this world, to have a sense of homecoming, a sense of being wedded to a place. Searching for a place to belong, I made my little list and I thought it was always very funny that Kentucky was not on the list. <laughs> um, and yet, ultimately, Kentucky is where my journey in search of place ends and where these essays in, in my new book begin. And my sense of place meets Bill Turner's sense of place as one who has always honored his connection to Kentucky and to the wilderness of spirit that our African American ancestors have brought to this place and to this land. Uh, I too have the same uh, sense about place as Bill. But let me first uh, begin by thanking uh, Chad Berry, the director of Appalachian Center for uh, uh, giving a nod to my uh, being a part of this, uh, this great place. Uh, I see Dean Brown here too. I want to thank people. When I came to Berea a couple years ago, there was a lot going on in my life and I didn't know what the world I was going to do. Um, but if we could kind of take Chad the way you would do if you had to draw somebody's blood and take out some of his spirit and just inoculate everybody with it, <laughs> life would be a lot better. Uh, I'd like to thank George uh, and uh, Samantha and Beth who did a wonderful job on this piece of work here. Thank y'all very much. Um, my sense of place hasn't always been so intact in my head. Uh, 43 years ago, when I was a boy of 20, I met John Stevenson, who used to be the president of Berea. I met John when I came out of Harlan County. I was a junior, having transferred to the University of Kentucky. And John said to me, Billy, I hear you from Harlan County. And I said, yes, that's true. He said, I think you ought to dedicate yourself to the study of black people in the mountains. All right. To which I said, you're out of your damn mind. <laughs> Sorry. Because, that's what you meant by I was a character. <laughs> because, uh, uh, to get that full story, uh, John hadn't grown up in a family of eight in Harlan County to a father who had three grades and a mama who had ten, ten grades. Uh, nor had John uh, experienced some of the things I had experienced in Harlan County. And certainly did he know very little personally about that period in 1966 when I was 20. And on the one hand, we were reading from Daniel Moynihan talking about the Negro family and all this pathos amongst black people. And I was coming out of Harlan County that Harry Call had just written about this pathos amongst white people. So I was saying, no way, Jose, I don't be bothered any of that stuff. But uh, John persisted and uh, then he later on introduced me to a man I see sitting here whom I love very dearly named Lowell Jones. And Lowell uh, uh, doesn't remember when he told me that uh, pursuing this work about blacks in Appalachia would be analogous to uh, 
looking in the north end of a southbound mule. <laughs> I think we ought to have Law stand up. Stand up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank
And then later, particularly when I got to college and I sat through my first few classes with these kids from Louisville and Lexington and the metropoles of Cincinnati, uh, and I realized after about a week that uh, they don't have any more sense than I have. <laughs> and they, they, haven't, they haven't done anything that we haven't done that, in fact, particularly in terms of my introduction to race, I had grown up in a place born in 1946, in the very year of my birth, in Lynch, Kentucky, there were 42 different nationalities working in the coal mine. 42 different nationalities. Cosmopolitan. Huh? I said cosmopolitan. Very cosmopolitan. In fact, when I first came to the University of Kentucky, my whole notion was, where are the black people around here? And I met nobody named Yablonsky and Horsky and Vicini, and I knew no Mexicans, and there was a Mexican boy across the street from my grandma named Camacho. And most of them just met some Mexican people last week. So my point is I had grown up in a place where they taught us Latin in the seventh grade. And my teachers had gone to Columbia University in the summers because of the Rosenwald programs to colored teachers in the South and got them very well educated. So I got a very good education. And one of the things I hope we're trying to do in this issue, for example, is, is disabuse people of one of the worst stereotypes about Appalachia that is most deceptive is that it's a homogenous people, white people, who, who have some kind of singular cultural heritage. And I, I, I hope you all take a look at the symbols up here that uh, Chad and Deborah and somebody else developed, I understand, of the quilt. One is diversity, change, and tradition. And so the traditional Appalachian quilt is somewhere there, but there's an African kind of Kintikoff and a merging of the two, as I understand it. So that's very important to me. And, and I spend a lot of my time trying to disabuse people this notion that there are no colored people here. Uh, that in fact, uh, throughout, uh, uh, my sister was born in Beckley, West Virginia. Uh, my daddy had worked in Maidwan. These places were just filled with black people in the 30s and the 40s, up through the 70s. And so, you know, when I go back and I read Alexis de Tocqueville's Democracy in America, and the way he sets up white folks in the mountains of the South, I say, my God, they should thank God for black people, because if it hadn't been for us, they would have been the you-know-whats. <laughs> and well, I'm not going to say it, that it, word. Of course, my experience of being growing up in the hills was that all the people that were around me were black people. And so one of the things Bill and I have been talking about recently is the diversities within blackness mm -hmm. because there was such a tension in the world I grew up in between those of us black people who lived in the rural areas in the hills you know with our outhouses and different things and the black people who lived in the city so I'll read my little some of my little piece because we want all of you to be picking up Appalachian heritage in the Kentucky black subcultures folks were united with our extended kin and our identities were more defined by labels like country and backwoods. It was not until I went away to college that I was questioned about Appalachia, about hillbilly culture. And it was always assumed by these faraway outsiders that only poor white people lived in the backwoods and in the hills. No wonder then that black folks who cherish our past, the independence that characterize our ancestors, seek to recover and restore their history, their legacy. I think it's very interesting, Bill, when you talk about uh, you use the word the hills and the hollers that also in that part of Kentucky where you grew up. Uh, I just read this morning about a meeting of some people in Lexington, all of whom are in the tech, techies, they call them geeks. I don't know who read that piece this morning in the Herald. And some New Yorker has branded this part of Lexington now. You know what they're calling it? Silicon holler. <laughs> now, tell somebody from Lexington that's a holler, and they'll turn themselves upside down, but it plays very well, if not on Wall Street today, <laughs> it plays well somewhere else. Uh, I want to say something about Appalachia, too, that's important to me. My fathers and his brothers uh, spent a lot of time with me and my four brothers uh, outside. We never use the word environmentalist. Uh, I never thought about I was an environmentalist when I was picking blackberries and uh, first time I came to Berea College, for example, I couldn't believe that they let all these squirrels just run around with nobody shooting them. <laughs> so, because hunting and fishing and going outside was a real part of our upbringing. And I'm very concerned about the way uh, this notion of environmentalism has been p packaged as a, quote, white issue. 
Uh, I'm spending time back home now in a network of about 40 churches that I have the uh, blessing this summer of receiving a grant through Berea College to map and profile some black churches in a seven county area in southeast Kentucky. And one of the things we want to talk to these kids about is the natural resources and environment that they see around them. I want them to go, Chad, to uh, Pine Mountain Settlement School. And you'd be surprised of all the environmental things that's around in that part of the country. Nobody brings these black kids into that, and we want to try that. Because I'm very concerned that just as Hollywood uh, is known as the entertainment capital of the world, if we don't raise a stink about it, certain parts of central Appalachia, like where I grew up, could come to be known as the extractive part of the world. That they'll just turn it into a barren landscape where they do nothing but extract coal, <laughs> mine for gas, and take out the trees. And they'll have a few little places on the edge, like Abingdon, Virginia, uh, uh, maybe Somerset, Kentucky, that will be commodified as these quaint little places like Dollywood. So people will come into the edge of the mountains and just kind of pick up on what it used to be like. And the rest of central Appalachia, parts of eastern Kentucky, southwest Virginia, southwest Virginia and southern West Virginia, could really look like a moonscape uh, by the time my grandchildren go back to see our home place in Lynch because they're now drilling 600 feet about 100 yards behind our house where we used to go out and, and fish in the creek. Well, I, I spent a lot of time in both my new book and in the piece that's in the, the Appalachian Heritage writing about black people's relationship to organic food production and to the environment because I believe that the very foundation of self-determination that, you know, when the urban militant black folks of the 60s began to talk about self-determination, they didn't bring, they didn't take that line back to those hillbilly folks that we could talk about who, were, who had a profound belief in self de being self-determination, determining. And I said, it is the foundation that is the root of my radical critical consciousness. Folks from the backwoods were certain about two things, that every human soul needed to be free and that the responsibility of being free required one to be a person of integrity, a person who lived in such a way that there would always be congruency between what we think, say, and do. So once again, you know, here's this world that I'm growing up in with Bebe and Daddy Gus and all of these people who don't, uh, some of whom don't read or write, but who are, who are just as sophisticated as Stephen Carter, the Yale professor who wrote the book on integrity, in saying that in order to live free, you've got to be this person of integrity, this person who has that continual congruency be what, between what you think, say, and do. So that I think that the person that I am, the dissident thinker that I am, has its roots there. And so part of my coming back to Kentucky at this stage of my life is to honor the, the depths of the experience and the memories that I think when people, you know, when I go out into the world, when I go to Norway or when I go to parts of Africa and people say, well, what makes bell hooks? To be able to talk about that experience of Kentucky and the environment and the hills in making bell hooks. You know, I just thought about it as you were uh, speaking there. I could close my eyes because I can remember a similar statement coming uh, from the mouth of Alex Haley. When Alex had seen the entire world and then he decided to latch himself onto John Rice Irvin and move right there near Clinton, Tennessee at the Museum of Appalachia. And he, within a month or two, somehow John Stevenson went down and met him. <laughs> and as you may recall, Alex, I believe, was a trustee at some point. Uh, and uh, he, he wrote a bit about what this place meant to him because he was from West Tennessee, from Henning, which was along the river 40 miles north of Memphis. But he chose to live you know, at the base of Jellicoe Mountain, literally, and I think uh, that meant a lot. Bill, let's talk a bit about something else here. Uh, I see Deborah Thompson back there. Where's Deborah? Deborah is our resident folklorist, a uh, wonderful person who directs student pro programs here at the Appalachian Center. And uh, I think it was in a book called, a workbook or a handbook on Appalachia that you did that piece on Appalachian folklore. And in here, uh, one of the things I note 
uh, maybe I shouldn't have said it, but there was this man named Cecil Sharp, or is it Cecil? Cecil, Cecil Sharp, Lowell. Lowell corrects me all the time. Uh, <laughs> Cecil, uh, as y'all know, came through the mountains. Uh, when did he come, Lowell, in the 18, early 1900s? Pardon? Cecil Sharp, when did he? 1916. 19... Uh, about 1916. 1916, he came through the mountains, and particularly in eastern Kentucky, looking for the music of Appalachia, the people doing the music. And I noted in an article I read that, uh, and this is in the New Yorker back in April, I just happened upon this, that this fellow, uh, looking into the aesthetics, the music of the mountains, uh, he had a disdain for hymns, spirituals, ragtimes, and blues. And uh, Mr. <laughs> uh, yeah, and that just left a lot of people out. <laughs> and Mr. Sharp uh, trekked through the hills and hollers of much of Appalachia, and he came upon a place thought to be near Wheelwright, Kentucky, and he expected to find there some of this music. And he said he, after all of his troubles and spent energies, he came upon an unidentified black township in Floyd County, Kentucky, where upon reaching this cove, he found it, quote, peopled with nothing but niggas. Ooh. Now just imagine all the young people were studying Cecil Sharp as the band leader, and you go where he goes and you'll learn about this stuff. So that a whole genre of black folks thinking and doing and music was left out simply because one person sent a signal that it ain't worth you studying. And, and so we find ourselves a hundred years later almost, or maybe, uh, yeah, uh, uh, we can talk a bit about Appalachian music, Appalachian literature, uh, and uh, uh, we, for example, there's a couple poems in here by a, a fellow who uh, uh, branded a part of the Appalachian thought, uh, whom you all may know named Frank X. Walker. I have a lot of uh, pride in saying I taught Frank when he was 18 years old at the University of Kentucky and uh, when Frank came up with the brand Afrolatcher my first reaction was said hmm I wonder what my grandmama's going to say because I can't get her to say nothing but colored still but <laughs> you know so so this notion of Afrolatcher as a another handle on this thing and my, my thought about it is that uh, if the world were like a, a, a big globe made of glass and somebody dropped it and it broke in all these fragments, uh, some of those fragments are Appalachian African American people. And so if Frank picked up a part of the fragment and more power to him, I wish that more people of color, but I am not uh, hung up on who does this. There's a lot to be known about black people's health issues, the whole banana pill. How do you say that word? You know what I mean. The whole kitten caboodle <laughs> of uh, social and sociological issues, health. I think it's, it's particularly important to study African, African American people in Appalachia, for example, from the framework of what happens when entire communities of people disappear, as happened throughout eastern Kentucky. I mean, had whites left West Virginia at the rate and in the numbers that blacks left West Virginia, there'd be a, there wouldn't be any more people in West Virginia than are in this room. Because well, let's the black remember that a lot of black leaving had to do with white supremacist assault, people taking the land, people just, you know, many of you read in the Lexington Herald last year about black farmers here in Kentucky who are white people would just show up, burn their homes, um, so that, there, that you had so much of a disappearance of our world. I, I tend to be a little more critical, I think, than Bill of the term Afrolatcha, precisely because I see as part of our work is saying, and part of what the work of this center is, is to say Appalachia is diverse. It isn't this one thing. And so I, I feel more like by constructing another little term outside that, we, we get back into this binary rather than thinking of this, this wonderful world. Um, you know, the one thing I've done in my life here in Kentucky that I've never done before was to be invited to the um, music festival uh, at, what's it, Creek, music. that just happened, Clear Creek, Creek <laughs> Music Festival to give a lecture. And I kept telling them, well, I've never, I've never come to a music festival, but Randy, the banjo player, what's his last name, Deborah? Wilson. Randy Wilson. Randy Wilson talked before me. And he's, 
and I, I talked about love because that's my main uh, obsession a lot of the time. <laughs> but uh, uh, that, that was in old Kentucky. We talked about cutting your eyes. I just cut my eyes and peel. Um, but I was talking about a sense of love as that which empowers us. And I use Randy as an example that when he lectures on the banjo, he ties it back to Africa. He talks about the fact that there was a period in American Appalachian history where when you saw a picture of a person with a banjo, it was a black person, and that that instrument found such amazing expression in among black musicians and often at integrated festivals. He talks about all that, and we talked about how as white and black people together during this recovering of a diversity in Appalachia, we can give back to one another our broken histories. Um, as I think every time I hear Randy talk about this, I feel that he's giving back to black people something that was taken away from us, which is our historical relationship to both Africa and to this instrument. Um, and hopefully to creating a climate where more black children can see those instruments as intimate to who they are, as much as they can grow up thinking about the saxophone and the trumpet, that they can think about the banjo as being central to the writing and the recording of our story. I don't think our students at Berea uh, realize how fortunate uh, they were last year when uh, the center through Deborah's work and Chad bought the Carolina chocolate drops here. Yeah. Uh, that was just a perfect example of here are some people who picked up a tradition that was very long. Let me mention something else, Bill, about this diversity issue. I, I should hope that those people in Appalachia who are by accident of birth white will consider the following. Uh, they're giving you a bad name. They're giving you a bad name. Uh, George wrote about it in the issue of Appalachian Heritage just before this one, I believe, George, when you talked about when this election year starts up, they're going to go back in the mountains and they're going to find some stereotypical hillbilly boys to talk about this colored fella running for president. Isn't that what you essentially said? <laughs> and well, don't you think it's interesting that where we've already had this image of the potential assassins of Obama, they were described as hill white hillbillies, yeah. illiterate. Um, they were given all of these... This is, these are the white men that were arrested in, think, in Denver. But it was interesting to me that, that this sort of conjuring up of there are these hillbilly white supremacists out there with their, their arsenals and what have you. And I kept thinking about, oh, that's, if, is that how it's going to go down, that you again have this pitting of a certain, like, the rest of the white world is civilized. And we can expect from them, you know, total respect for Obama and uh, his family, but there are these white hillbillies. If you have time tomorrow, there's a conference on race and politics at Marshall uh, tomorrow uh, in Huntington, three hours or so from here. I hope to go myself. But uh, back in the spring, uh, I tried my best. I tried to take a, a look at that. Uh, uh, I decided to cobble together a part of eastern Kentucky and West Virginia and Virginia and renamed it a place called West Kentucky. <laughs> and I was essentially trying to say that there are areas in the United States like Chicagoland, um, I think around Ohio, what do they call it, uh, Darren, you're in here, uh, Ohio, Kentucky, and uh, yeah, O-K-I, okay, okay, Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana, there's Delmarva, there are all these places, but when they get to Appalachia, the, the cultural stereotype that's conjured up. I think it can only be beaten back by whites from Appalachia who take it upon themselves to say, hey, that doesn't represent all of us. That those of you who know where your heart is, whatever your politics are, that stereotype has to be beaten down by people themselves, and you cannot leave it up to the Hollywood and New York-based media to somehow start depicting this area differently. And that's in the same way that those of us who were coming of age in the 60s uh, who were trying to redefine the way black people were stereotyped, we could not wait for somebody else to do it for us. We had to do it ourselves. And I think the onus is really on particularly older whites from Appalachia to step up to the plate, to use a terrible phrase, 
and take head on this malicious depiction of this region uh, that's being depicted much like Alex de Tocqueville depicted it in the Marx in America way back before. Well, I'm sorry that many of you were not here when Elizabeth came to show her film Stranger with a Camera. From Apple and Shop. one of the things that came out of that showing was I asked the audience and asked Elizabeth to talk about the black child that we see in the film. And one of the things that was very curious is most of the white people present had not seen the black child in the film. But part of what Elizabeth was trying to do was challenge our perception of that part of the world that she was remembering, that she grew up in, and that she was remembering that part of the world as having an intermingling of black and white hillbilly people. And it, it's just fascinating to see that even when the image was there, people could not claim it because in people's minds still, there's such a fixed sense of Appalachia white, Appalachia poor. Appalachia you know? uneducated. Yeah. And the kinds of uh, values of anarchy, I mean, I think there are still books to re be written about the presence of a anarchist values in Appalachian, among Appalachian hillbillies, both black and white, and Native American groups of people who had just such extreme senses of what we must do to protect freedom and what we, we must do to protect our right to be self-inventing. I mean, when you, when you read Toni Morrison and she talks about inventing ourselves, well, that's what I learned among black, quote, hillbilly people, that we had the right to be self-inventing, to claim our relationship to the land and our relationship to certain metaphysical notions of spirituality, that we're not rooted in the sort of citified, institutionalized culture. And this is something I write about a lot. I'm, I'm writing about, even here in Berea, that um, when I bought my house out on, on Owsley, that so many people said to me, aren't you afraid? But you know, because I'm out there <coughs> passing the trailers, passing the so-called poor white people, the hillbillies, the rednecks, but then when I have my house on Estill Street, nobody says, are you afraid? And, and I think the thing that's so fascinating and disturbing is how many of those stereotypes are still fixed in our imaginations today. The stereotype of the white poor as necessarily more racist than um, white people who have wealth. Um, and it's interesting to think about how this election has basically called so much of this into play again. These, these fixed ideas, you know, white working class people. I mean, I can't tell you how many white redneck men I know here in Berea who are talking about how they're going to vote for Obama and the, the fact that actually they did vote for Bush. But they're, they're very, their concerns are very issue-based, and they feel that they were let down on issues of work um, and sustainability of their lives. But are we going to see that in the media? Are we going to have that nuanced notion of white identity? I mean, as you say, we can't have it unless people are continually working to put it there. Bill and I are going to close at this point, and we have a good 20 minutes to have conversation to answer questions. Who has a question? Yes. <laughs> George wanted to hug and we get a question. Well, and say your name and... Um, and we'll repeat the question and go from there. If people can't hear it, I think people might be able to hear it. Yes, ma'am. I'm Beth Bonham from Louisville and um, I teach at the University of Louisville in the School of Nursing. I'm presently doing a study. My um, research focus is mental health issues of youthful offenders. And um, I have been interviewing young men, mostly, in a detention center in Louisville. And based on what I've heard you say this evening as it relates to Appalachia, I'm also wondering about the sense of place and the sense of belonging to young black males in the urban setting. And I'm thinking, based on what I'm hearing you say and what I've heard their stories be, that there are many, many similarities. That they don't have a place. They never had the opportunity even to find squirrels um, or pick blackberries. Yeah. <laughs> so the, um, the topic is the relationship between young, black, young urban blacks right. 
and Appalachian black. All right. But I mean, part of what we hope we we're hoping to do, both in work that we're doing individually and hopefully together, is to to talk about what will it mean for black urban folk to look towards the hills and to the people who are there and the histories that are there as a source of their identities. Like, for example, in, in my book, I begin to do a lot of reading and work around George Washington Carver and just found you know, amazing things about him that I didn't know, his, his mysticism with nature, his paintings, um, you know, that are there uh, for people to see um, if, you, if you go to, to Alabama. And um, it's part of, part of what I think we owe to urban black youth is that connecting of their histories. I mean, part of what's happened to us as colonized black people is that we're cut off from the diversities of our history. We simply don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm writing a new book on teaching, and the chapter that I just finished was on integrity. And I, I recall being in high school and asking my white teachers, why didn't we read anything by black writers? And I was told, black writers haven't written anything. Um, and, but think about that in terms of the whole impact of the colonization of the black mind, that I have to grow up go to college out west before I can begin to see the legacies of black writers differently. So I think that, that what is demanded of us is the connection of those urban experiences. I don't know if many of you saw in Oprah's magazine months ago um, the focus on the black, the school that is predominantly black in Michigan and in Detroit where they are growing organic Guard, their organic gardens and so that the, to, to me the point is to link those two experiences and to link them through uh, educating people about how we are connected rather than continuing to define black experience through an urban lens. Yeah I think that question, Beth was it? Yes. In terms of uh, these young black men, uh, without a doubt uh, the relationship between neurosis, mental illness, maladaptation, and family breakup is just a no-brainer. Uh, and uh, how well we know the effects of almost 50 years now of people who left Harlan County, uh, let us say, in the 1950s, which was the second great migration out of the rural south into urban America. And so that now you have literally two generations of people who have grown up disconnected from their roots, from their families. And everybody knows uh, how important it is to have traditions, something that you can say, Grandma did this, Grandpa did that. And if you don't know Grandma and Grandpa, that makes for a, a, a disaster. Uh, uh, these, th this whole notion of, of the kind of root, rootlessness the normlessness, you know, just the catch-as-catch-can lifestyle is at, at the basis of a lot of what we see happening that gets those boys in that place, uh, you know, where, where they're so easy to, to contain that, that energy. Uh, uh, for example, I think one of the things they must not learn, and this may get into the, what has happened with the quality of education for African Americans, as I think has been influenced in a detrimental way by almost a wholesale removal of black teachers from classrooms. I'm not saying a white teacher cannot do this work, but there's some great difference between achievement and the gaps. I mean, for example, when I graduated in a very small class at Lynch Colored School, uh, there were only 52 of us in our graduating class, but 37 of us went to college. 37 out of 52. And as my mom used to always say, his cousin is a real doctor. <laughs> uh, 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 my point being, nobody, you know, nowadays is taking a look at what is happening to these children because we're blaming, you know, environment as the determining factor. But I was taught in that traditional community where I came up, and the word community is operative here. Uh, the black community nowadays, in my own view, is in most instances, not much more than a physical space which people of color occupy. Because community has much more to do than the place you live in geo as a geophysical space. 
It's a psychological space. It's a family space. And absent that, nobody teaches you, boy, no matter what they do to you, boy, no matter what neighborhood you live in, boy, no matter if your mom went to the 10th grade, your dad went to the 3rd grade, you can't lean on that and call yourself a victim. Get off your butt and you get out here and you make something out of yourself. They never tell you what to make out of yourself. But somehow you know that that's what they, my, my father went to the 3rd grade. How can he keep telling us, you make something out of yourself? You want to say, oh, dad, uh, uh, how can you explain yourself? And, but we somehow knew that he knew something was out there. And I dare say that my children uh, uh, and my grandchildren are somehow much better off because our families, you know, there was a lot of times I just said, man, I'm getting out of this marriage. Well, I've been married 40 years as you. Because that somehow where we grew up, number one, if you divorced and broke up, you got put out of the company house. I just found that out. <laughs> you know, so a lot of people stay together to have a place to stay. <laughs> I heard Dad used to say, I'd leave you, woman, if it wasn't for these children. And they stayed married 55 years. Who's pushing that to this younger generation? Uh, you know, nobody is. And I think that the young men you're talking to, uh, it may take... As we go back and read John Stevenson with David Walls, that book called Appalachia in the 60s, I think it was. Yeah. If we did something now on African Americans in Appalachia or in America in the 80s or, or in, the two, in this century, first part of this century here, we would be saying, as someone wrote in that book that John them did, that it may take a generation and a half before Appalachia catches up. You remember that article? Kephart did it, I think his name was. He, he wrote about guided migration and education amount said this might take 25 to 30 years for this to get solved. Well, we're looking at a situation in 2008, if it takes 25 or 30 years for these young people in the inner cities of Baltimore and Boston and Chicago and Louisville, where my daughter teaches at a school in New York City where 85% of the young African Americans do not finish their 11th grade. That's appalling. That's appalling. If, they, if that were happening on Wall Street, they'd bail them out. <laughs> <laughs> Is there another question? Yes, ma'am. Enchanta. Um, my name is Enchanta Jackson. And I what a wonderful name. <laughs> I have a question. Um, I grew up in Lexington, Kentucky, but I spent my teenage years in Burksville, Kentucky. Where? Burksville, Kentucky. Oh, yes, Burksville. And in Burksville is where I really um, learned a lot about racism and um, the kind of the color separation between black people. Um, in Burksville, the lighter-skinned black people were treated different than the dark-skinned black people. And if you were um, lighter-skinned, you had a whole lot more privi privileges. And also, if you got a white boyfriend, that was even better. People treated you a lot different. And it was just kind of like you were more accepted if you were lighter-skinned. Um, and then the um, more dark-skinned black people, especially the more poor black people, really was kind of shunned from the white community. And um, one of the things I realized after coming to Berea is I would like to go back to Burksville to try to change a lot of the mindset. But I really don't know, because racism is still really high. And so we, all, most majority of the black people who live in Burksville don't work in Burksville. They can't find jobs. They have to go to chicken factories and Monticello and places like that. And I was just wondering, what is it that I could do if I if I can't get a teaching job, if I can't get if I can't start up a program, organizational program? What what's some of the more simple things, the um, kind of the bottom ground work I could do, just as coming out of college and going back there and trying to make it? Like I mean, well, one of the primary things you can do is is what Bell Hooks did, which is write write a memoir about your experience. I mean, we we'd be surprised how much people learn from reading about experiences. I mean, just what we're talking about, about how, how, how do we keep that circle unbroken? In many ways, when I began to write about my Kentucky experience, it was also about trying to, to recover a different past. And for you, one way to both speak within and back to that community would be to write about it and to document. Because, um, I mean, a lot of what we, we're trying to do is uncover spaces of experiences that have never been documented, but that we know to be there. Uh, Enchanta, my first thought when you said you grew up in Burksville, I thought of a fellow named Linwood Montel. Montel. That's Burksville, the saga of Coe Ridge. Yeah. That's a very part of, excuse me, no. C-O-E, right? Was yeah. the saga of Coe Ridge. Yeah. Please, that book is well 
respect that. I think he taught for many years at Western Kentucky State University. So it's been done a little bit, but I think doing your own story. And the idea that the, the lighter skinned blacks were treated better, uh, they were probably some kin to a lot of the white folks down there. So, that's, you know, this, it, this place has been diverse a lot longer than people are willing to admit, you know what I'm saying? Uh, there's a similar place like that in eastern Kentucky, in Perry County. It's called uh, Red Fox. So Route 15 right between Hazard and... But even now, in our communities, that you can go into many places where you see poor and working class people from the, the mountains and the hills who have blended children, mm -hmm. black and white, and the, so there's a whole new generation of Appalachia that, um, that, that will have a story to tell. There's a wonderful story being written as we speak probably by the fellow who just left Berea as a student body president. What's that fellow's name? Somebody up there right Alex Gibson. Alex Gibson. Al Alex Gibson from Jackson County, was he? Uh, yes. And he's around the world in Vietnam, South Africa, Philippines, yes. and he's studying biracial people because he is biracial. So he has, there's a story about, about that. And I, I, I'll, I'll start forwarding you Alex's uh, journal, which he sends us every week or two. Wonderful things he's looking at. Uh, if I may interject, in China, in 1962, uh, I, I visited the, uh, in the two majority black counties in Tennessee, Haywood County and Fayette County, and there was a man, John McFerrin, in Fayette County, Tennessee, that owned a little store, and so he was independent, and so when people registered to vote and were evicted, they could come on his land and set up tents <laughs> and continue to live. There was a man by the name of Odell Sanders in Haywood County, that ran the laundromat, and he was also independent and owned his own land. And, and those people were small business people in that community where everybody knew them. And because of, of their, uh, because they had been small businessmen and because they had land and, and a little bit of wealth, they were able to have a tremendous impact in that community when a key struggle occurred. Other questions? Uh, by the way, I certainly encourage you, don't uh, frame your uh, journey back to Burksville in negative terms. What if it won't, won't work? Start off by saying it will work and go back. And I'll bet you there's some people right in this room uh, that will help you to go back and do what you know needs to be done. Now, you obviously have people there. They'll be there. So, so prepare your, you know, think through your dream but as Bill and I were talking the other day about somebody that's dear to both of us, it's one thing to dream these wild kind of things, but set out a plan <laughs> as to how you would make this dream unfold for yourself. And there are adults who would be quite willing to help you. Stephanie Browner, you work for her? Piece of cake. <laughs> uh, another question? Oh, we'll have our, a, a last question here, and, and then dr eat, drink. There's a question. Uh, oh, oh. Well, I just want... Uh, I want to congratulate you on mentioning Cecil Sharp. You're the first black person I've ever heard mention. <laughs> I want to tell you a little, a little uh, joke on him. Uh, he was a Fabian socialist and agnostic or whatever, and he didn't have any use for Appalachian music either, and he even talked over in Clay County about the only difference between the people eating at the hotel, which probably wasn't uh, up to the standards of some English hotels, you know, the only difference between them and the hogs, they grunted louder. <laughs> but he went down to North Carolina and uh, someone sang him a song called Swannanoa Tunnel, T-U-N-N-E-L. He thought they were singing Swannanoa Town O, Town with a hyphen, you know, the English for some reason had a, had a way of putting an O on the end. I, I need a folklorist to explain that to me sometime. So, but anyhow, he put that in his book thinking this is, because all he was interested in was English folk songs in the Southern Mountains. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he was celebrating the memory of the people, and I'm in awe of that too. <laughs> but that was a Negro work song mm -hmm. because the people who <laughs> dug the Swannanoa Tunnel at great sacrifice were black prisoners mm -hmm. who were consigned to work in there and many of them died and that was a black work song. Oh, okay. I knew I learned from some new lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's a question back here. Yeah, we'll have this yes, sir. Question. Well, I guess I intend to explanation about what she was saying really kind of and is it Jonathan who you know and love I'm sorry yeah Jonathan Johnson when I graduated 
Um, but um, Enchanted Story definitely kind of answers part of my question, actually, because I was going to, I was reflecting back what you, you all were talking about, your educational experience, where you were growing up being educated by um, those that looked like you and, and achieved and were educated at different um, of, of universities across the country and came back to, to, to where they were from. And, and, and it kind of um, allowed me to think about, well, what about those who are there now? You know, because, we, because you know, they, they came back because there was opportunity, because they were some from other opportunities, as far as access to teaching in other places across the country because it wasn't integrated. But what about those um, young people right now who are, who are being educated? Do they still have that value, uh, that opportunity to have, be, be taught by people that have more education, and they could also learn to aspire that I can too do this. Um, so that, that, that's, that I, kinda, I guess I'm curious and I'm kind of concerned as well. Well, at least in my part of East Kentucky, and I know this to be the case in Southwest Virginia and Southern West Virginia, uh, there's been a real massive brain drain. And so that the young people left there do not get the in, to interact you know, with people who, as you say, look like them, that say, you can do this too. And uh, I have the ple pleasure of going back to Eastern Kentucky. I mean, I'm going back to Eastern Kentucky before Sunday, probably. I'll go down there. But uh, I got to tell you, the situation is, is dire uh, in the Mount Z. Um, the unemployment is unbelievable. In the little town I grew up in, where our lives were regulated by the blowing of a whistle three times a day, everybody and daddy got up and went to work. Well, in Lynch, Kentucky, not one person is employed as a coal miner, not a single one. People exist on what you call transfer payments. First of the month, a check comes in a mailbox. Then there's an underground economy driven by opiates, uh, oxycotton and methamphetamines, cocaine and marijuana. And a lot of young people do not get to see uh, role models or get exposed to what could be. And it's, 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 it's heartrending to see it. Uh, but I, I believe that uh, there are some things happening uh, in terms of, uh, just last week we had a thing here at Berea called the Brushy Fork Annual Institute, where there were some people who came down, some people of color out of West Virginia, Eastern Kentucky, uh, Southwest Virginia, getting to be a part of this Berea network where they want to go, they will go back in their communities and work on some of these, these kinds of things. So uh, where, where there is uh, vision, the people prosper. Uh, and I think just the opposite is where there is no vision, the people perish. So we do have some people who have a vision. How can we help these children to get the opportunities that we had? But you know, a lot of our opportunities, my opportunities in fact, were, were framed by a schoolhouse. It was framed by a school, and it was framed by working parents. It's unbelievable what it means to see your daddy go to work all the time, man. It's, it's hard to explain it. Uh, so that if you could imagine like the young inner city boys, who never saw a man go to work. So that work becomes, what is that? And they therefore don't see themselves ever working. And, and so uh, there's a lot of work rather to be done then uh, to, to bring to light the, the, uh, the status of people, particularly in central Appalachia, southern West Virginia, east Kentucky, southeast Virginia, and of course, uh, uh, any of these distressed counties that the Appalachian Regional Commission talks about. We had a discussion the other day about uh, funding goes to distressed counties and my comment was, gee, the black people left the distressed counties before y'all defined them as distressed. <laughs> so that they live in the counties now that aren't distressed relative to the distressed ones, but they are very distressed in some of these counties, but the government doesn't define them that way. So short of the long story is a lot has to be done but I, I just believe deeply in the indomitability of the human spirit. I think people are going to pull through this. Uh, and, and, I think, uh, Bill, it's also important as we close to say that one of the mechanisms that many people are going to use for survival is a return to those kinds yes. of values of self-determination of, I'm going to have to grow my food <laughs> because that's the only way I'm going to eat. You know, I'm going to have to tend to the, that little piece of land that I may possess that came down generations to generations because that's the only place I'm ever going to live. There I'm going to have to be my sister's that's, keeper. That's right. There's not going to be any my migration you know, from my shack to the Mac Mansion because what we see happening both in Appalachia and all around is actually a giving up. I mean, we're being told 
that many Mac mansions are going to be sitting empty. <laughs> And that what people are coming back to, many people, are smaller spaces, easier to heat, more collective living. So that's why I think it's important to call up the past, not just in some sentimental way, but as a, as a really radical statement of, I mean, what, it would, what would it mean for black people in this nation to be talking again about 40 acres and a meal? And, and what does it mean to, to, to see the restore to our lives the place that agriculture once had. Thank you so what much. A great way to